hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask if they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. I'm really excited to bring you this special Veterans Day um, episode, and I'm really honored to have um, a dear friend, uh, Major General Marsha Anderson, in the studio. Um, I'm going to talk about her accolades in just a moment. But um, but Major Anderson, thank you so much for being here. Major General Anderson, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. And um, you can just call me General or Marsha. All right. Either all one right. will work. Okay. All right. I'll call you General. <laughs> <laughs> you usually get me for calling you General. But on this show, I'm going to call. I'm going to. I'll, I'll refer to you as General. I'm so glad. I'm going to get into your accolades in just a moment. But every guest who comes on Black Like Me has to go through a series of black icebreakers. Ah. Ah. And so they're fun. They're, they're, they're not hard. This is easy compared to that military, military stuff that you had you had to do. But just a couple of questions, just, just for fun. It just helps us to get more relaxed in the studios. Growing up, did you enjoy grits or cream of wheat? Oh, I was cream of wheat with sugar <laughs> you were cream and of wheat? carnation in it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I Wait didn't a minute. Grow up in the South, so Wait I don't a like minute. Chris. The general, this is the first. This is, hey, hold on, hold on. Wait, where's the bell? Where's the bell? Hold on just a minute. The general just broke it down. Oh, my goodness. Cream of wheat. Now, okay, so did you, were you deprived? Did you not have access to grits? Is I, there something that made you go to cream of wheat? I had access to grits. I just didn't <laughs> like them. That's so, so what did you like about, okay, what did you like about cream of wheat? We, this is a no judgment zone, so we are not going to judge you on black like me on the air, but off the air, we're going to get you. Well, I, no, but, but. I basically treated it like it was ice cream because I said I put I put butter, sugar, and carnation in it. And carnation in it. Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh, that, I bet you were wired all day. <laughs> yes. You know what? Once you put butter and sugar on it, grits, cream of wheat, they might all actually taste the same. Oh man. Now I know I'm part of your resume, uh, and we're still in the fun icebreaker part. We haven't gotten into the more serious stuff, um, General. But um, you live with your with your mother and your grandmother um, while growing up. Did your grandmother watch stories? Oh, my goodness, my grandmother watched stories. And did she call them stories? She called them stories. See, a, a large portion of our listeners are white, and they listen in because they enjoy um, African Americans just talking about things that we have in common. And um, and they try to figure out how could it be that people who grew up in Beloit and Madison have some of these same experiences mm -hmm. while they're so different from theirs. And so in the African American community, our folks refer to soap operas. My friends call them soaps. But soap operas, our folks, our, parents, our grandparents call them stories. That's correct. Do you remember? And, do you remember what stories your your grandmother liked? Oh my goodness! Oh, it was it was before Days of Our Lives. So General she, Hospital. General, General Hospital. General Hospital, but the not the one that we grew up with. We probably you and I remember right. Luke and Laura. No, this was the original General Hospital. Oh, with Steve and Audrey yes. and some of those old folks. Yes. Yes, and in the day was structured around the stories. Tell me about that, because that's true. Cause like you, like the washing and the chores and stuff? Everything had to be done before or was going to happen after the <laughs> stories. Because you were not going to have it happening during the stories. Because they sat down and watched the stories. Yes. Oh, my goodness. And so was this in St. Louis? Um, well, I my first couple years I was living in Beloit. And then we moved to East St. Louis, Illinois. East St. Louis. Okay, that's right. The Illinois East St. Louis, side. Illinois. And, yes, that's where this happened. That's, that's what the, uh, so did you have any relatives who had plastic on their furniture? Did you were, you were you part of those families where you had an aunt or someone who had plastic? Yes. We went to visit some relatives who lived in <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri one time. And I remember walking in their house and wondering, why is everything covered in plastic? <laughs> and I'm going to take you back to one more thing. Yes. You know, we, we couldn't afford color televisions. Right. Well, they had one of those little color filters that you put on front of the black and white television. Wait, was that a real thing? It was a real thing. It was like a plastic filter that's supposed to make your TV look like it was a color TV. Did it, did it work? No. It did. <laughs> Man, I love that. Growing up, have you ever heard of the term tenderheaded? Oh, yes. I was not tenderheaded. You were not tender. You I know what? Was. Wait, wait. You said that with a bit of pride. I noticed folks who aren't tenderheaded say that, was, oh, I was not tenderheaded. I could take a hot comb. I could take a straight comb. I could take a pick. So you were not tenderheaded. And I could take the original version of Ultra Sheen. <laughs> on my head <laughs> yes so i was not tender-headed <laughs> i was very tender-headed you could listen you could look at my head and it would start it would start hurt and it wasn't because i had bad hair but when my hair got long 
my scalp was sore to the touch. So it even hurt to brush my hair. So for mm-hmm. me, tender headed. That sometimes they use that for people who have bad hair. <laughs> like they couldn't, they couldn't comb it. But you could. You said you could take an ultra perm. Yes, ultra sheen perm. Oh, yeah. ultra sheen perm. Mm-hmm. Oh, did you ever super, have a, a super? super. Oh, oh, it was a super. Yeah. Did you ever have a Jerry curl? I'm embarrassed to admit, yes, I had a Jerry curl. <laughs> you shouldn't be embarrassed. Oh, it was just so messy. <laughs> and now you look back and you think, what was I what thinking? What was I thinking? Because you had to wear those little plastic caps, right? Yes. And then, uh, wait, please tell me, please tell me, General Anderson, you did not wear the cap that had the, like the bib in front. Did you see those that had like the plastic, but then it had like a like a baseball bib um, so that it keeps the sun out your eyes? Thankfully, I never saw one of those. You never saw it. was ugly. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. And I know you. I know your mother, your grandmother plus, must have thought, "Girl, wash that stuff out your hair. You're getting it all over the pillow sheets. You're getting it all over the place." Well, I, by when I did mine, I was in college, so I was living so, by myself, so uh-huh. nobody could really, you know, sweat me about messing up anything. Right. But, um, but yeah, it was it messy. Did. Do you remember that scene from Coming to America? And that, <laughs> that 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 character is is Eric LaSalle. I know you played on uh, on ER. Yes. But like like all of them were sitting <laughs> in a in a straight back chair with Jerry Curls. They were on a couch. They and when they couch. all got up from the couch, there were it three was... grease spots on the wall. <laughs> yes, I remember that very well. Oh my goodness. Okay, let me see. Last last question. This is great. Did your mother or grandmother ever say, "Girl, go out there and get me a switch off that tree, or go get me something to whip you with"? My great grandmother did that to me. You knew your great grandmother? Yes, I knew my great grandmother. So she did that to you. She did that to me. She watched us during the summer. And <laughs> I was just, I was always in trouble, I guess. And uh, yes, go outside and get me a switch off the tree. Oh, and you better not bring one that's too small. I mean, you better you, you better not act like that she's playing with you. It, it better be thicker than her finger, not yours. But her, her <laughs> finger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. People, great grandparents can't do that nowadays. That's what, that's what human services is for. You can't. But not only can you not use the switch, you can't make the child go get the switch. They, no. they go get you it. No. And then sometimes they would like wet it or peel it in front of you. And I'm... They never did that, but she <laughs> she had a pretty wicked arm. Wow, that's right. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I love doing those eye break, icebreakers because it allows us just to laugh a little bit before we get into <laughs> into our to our subject matter. Um, so, folks, I've been knowing um, General Anderson for, for years. Uh, she and her husband, Amos, are, are good friends of ours, and, and, and we do things together um, along with Jackie. Um, but I've always been um, impressed by her story. And because I'm a storyteller, I always love to, to hear people's stories. Let me just tell you a little bit about, about Marsha Anderson. Um, she lived in Beloit when she was young, but finished school in St. Louis. Um, studied political science and at Creighton University. Did grad school. You did your JD um, at Rutgers in Newark. So you so you moved all over the place. I didn't realize that there was United States um, Army War College. Each of the services, if you want to become a general, you're required to have or an admiral a master's degree, and those. Those that's institutions confer master's degrees. So and they are. there's a Naval War College, that's there's an Army you. War College, and there's an Air War College. Wow. And so you got your master's in strategic studies. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's why we have these conversations because people do these, these, these uh, amazing things. So, so when you enrolled in that program in 203, you were aspiring at that time it's for higher ranks in, in the military services? Because you said, I know it's required if you want to be an admiral or, or if you want to be a general. So were you, were you having thoughts of wanting to move in that direction? You, If you are, yes, you're encouraged to do that. Uh, I actually graduated in 2003. It was a two-year program. Got you. Um, there's a one-year resident program, and I went through the non-resident program. So it was a two-year program. Wow. And so you have already hit a couple of other marks in your career you have commanded um you've had to complete a, your other professional military education to even be you've qualified and then there's an application process and a board process and then people are selected from that process that's that's amazing that's 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 so impressive you also come from um your parents have some military at least your dad has some military experience but your father was in the korean war Yes. And uh, so he's he's a vet also. I'm going to ask you a story about him that I remember you telling me about. But then your mother's a trailblazer because she, she, as we've done our research on you, we found that she was one of the first groups of students who integrated Catholic schools in East St. Louis. St. Louis, Oh, in St. Louis, where she was growing in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Got you. So, you. so you have this good stuff happening in you. But, but one of the things, among others, that really impresses me is that you're the first African-American woman to become a major general in the U.S. Army. 
reserve, and that's just to be lauded. Now, did I did I get all those? T- is 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 a is it two star general? It's two-star? a two star general, and it actually was the first in the history of the entire army. So that would have been wow. not for just so the active army, the army reserve, and the national guard as well. Um, wow. Now the national guard can have people as two stars in their states, mm-hmm. but in order to be recognized federally, you have to go through a different process. Gotcha. So, but I was the first one to make it through the, the for all three branches um, uh, in the Army and mm-hmm. be federally recognized, which meant I had to be nominated by the White House and then confirmed by the Senate. Oh, my goodness. Now, when you're getting up doing this, General Anderson, you're not thinking, because I know you're not thinking, I want to make history, I want to make history. You're just a competent leader. If, if there's a trajectory um, within your career, you want to just follow that. But at what point did you just think, okay, this... This is serious. All right. This is this is groundbreaking. At first, I'm just, you know, I'm you know, I've got my J.D. I've got this. I've got that. But all right. Now we're about to make some history. When did when did it occur to you that that's that that's where you were? It actually didn't occur to me until after our public affairs officer came to tell me <laughs> all these people wanted to come to my promotion ceremony It because I was at Fort Knox. Mm. And then the news stations were coming from Louisville. And I was like, why? She says, well, you're making history. I go, come on, really? <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it. I was just trying really? to. I was just focused on trying to do my best job. Sure. And there were people who were encouraging me to try for the next level. And so I simply put my name in the hat and I really didn't even think about it. I didn't even actually know at that time that I was uh, one of the first one stars. It didn't, I just didn't think about it. Mm. And um, I was actually kind of, not a, not, I was kind of disappointed actually that there were so few sure. at that point sure. because the army had been in existence over 240 years. Right. And so, but then to find out that I was the very first was pretty amazing. Wow. And so the media came in, and I'm sure that caught some national attention, too. So, you know, like, like as my staff is, you know, they're really thorough. Like, we watched a video of you on C-SPAN, like an hour interview. So once you, once you entered into this new arena, it got, a, it got people's attention because, you know, Major General, this really is major. I know you... I've known you for years. You've never taunted. You never talked about this or celebrated it. There's usually someone else bragging on it. But this is really major. It, it was. And as I, I came to appreciate that. Sure. And at first I was kind of I was actually a little annoyed. I didn't well, I didn't really? want because I didn't want I, sometimes people want to be the first at something. So sure. they're focused, laser focused on it. <laughs> right. And I wasn't. So it was very it was very accidental. But then I decided to embrace it because mm-hmm. I said, now I have a responsibility and I need to be a role model. I need to be above reproach in all that I do. And I just wanted to get out there and do it right because I wasn't going to get a second chance. Sure, sure. And so I wasn't real enthusiastic about doing all these interviews, but it it turned out to be okay. I actually got to be pretty good at it. Sure, sure, I bet. And I enjoyed it. And um, and the Army kind of recognized it. Somebody told me I had a high TVQ. I have still have no idea what that <laughs> means. But I was on television a number of times. Mm-hmm. And again, I just decided to embrace it and run sure. with it sure. because it, it hopefully would motivate somebody to stay in the service mm-hmm. or to motivate somebody to join. And also it gave people a different perspective on people in the military. I can't tell you how many times people would say, I didn't know you were in the Army. And I said, because, well, you don't look like, I don't know what that means. What do people look like who are in the army? Because <laughs> I, I don't get that, that whole right, response. Right. So it, it disabused people of a lot of, I think, sure. misperceptions and strange notions. Mm. How does your dad, a vet, respond? respond? Because you, there's an interesting story around this. Now, of course, your dad knew that you were in the military, but did you process this with him or was he as surprised when you when you got you know got this rank does he call you general well does he he, salute you i'm sorry let me shut up so you can answer (laughs) he calls me general now i keep telling him to stop doing that but um and your dad is how old my dad is 91 years old oh my goodness and And still works every day he still works every day he supervises the culinary (laughs) arts kids at beloit high school in beloit wisconsin so Um, he calls you general so when he so when he found out that this happened well, my dad, um, he was the second call I made. At first, I called Amos to tell him sure. that I'd gotten the news that I had I was going to be nominated, and unless something strange happened, I was going to be confirmed. Um, so I called my dad um, and let him know, but I said, this is a nomination, Pops. I have not been confirmed yet. You really need to not tell people. Right. Okay, fine. <laughs> so then I thought about it, and about 20 minutes later, I called back the house, and my stepmom answered. I said, well, where's dad? She said, we well, got his hat and his coat, and he left. I said, where was he going? 
She said the barber shop. I knew it was going to be all oh. over the entire state of Wisconsin shortly thereafter because <laughs> he went and told all his buddies at the barber shop. Definitely. That's like that's, that's like a, that's like the old days. They said tell us tell a person telegram. You tell people at the barber shop. Right. Everyone knows. That's right. That's this. That's, that's where you go to get the news. That's where you go to find out what's going on. Yeah. So he was he was so proud of that. He was. He was. Oh my goodness. So tell me, you have this incredible role, this trail break, uh, breaking role as as a two star general in the army but then you have a day job back here in madison tell me a little bit about about what you what you do there i'm the clerk of court for the united states bankruptcy court for the western district of wisconsin so bankruptcy is really a federal remedy for people is it, it really is not a state state courts don't have the same system they sure, may have something sure. that looks like it but if you want to go through a bankruptcy and have your credit restored and have your creditors stop calling you, you file in the United States bankruptcy courts. Got so there's you. there's 90 of us around the country and and in the uh, territories. So that's my that's my that's my full time job. That's your full time that job. I balanced while I was in the reserve. And normally during the reserve, I would you know do my weekend duty, mm-hmm. maybe my two or actually more weeks of summer, um, and or other times during the year. But then of course 9 11 happened, and so many of us were call to duty and we had to take leaves of absence from our full-time jobs wow so and so i assume you were called to duty during that time as well yes and for how long well after i got promoted to um one star a brigadier general um i had a position in arlington heights where i ran a unit that covered the western half of the united states and I had the pleasure of working with Lieutenant General Russell Honore as part of that job. Really, you should have him on sometime. Um, I would love that. And um, anyway, so my second assignment as a one star, as a Brigadier General, they assigned me to Fort Knox, Kentucky, mm-hmm. to be the Deputy Commanding General for the Army's Human Resources function. Wow! And so that was a that was a pretty big job, and I was very happy doing that because sure. my background was in personnel in the Army mm-hmm. and administration and training. So I was very happy doing that. Sure. So in any event, um, that was my second um, one-star job. And so once I got promoted to two-star, they had to find another job for me. Sure. The original job they had for me due to a reorganization was eliminated. And so Mm -hmm. then they decided to make me the deputy chief for the Army Reserve. But that meant then that I had to go, yes, that that meant then that I had to go move to Washington, D.C. and be full-time at the Pentagon. So you had an office at the Pentagon? Yes, I did. You ever see Colin Powell? No, no. Okay. I mean, long, he, he I, mean, he, I mean, he didn't stop through for tours or anything. He, he didn't, didn't have not. an emeritus. If he came office. in, he didn't come by to visit me. <laughs> yeah. but, <laughs> but you had an office in the Pentagon. Yes, I did. A couple of offices. I had a couple of jobs while I was there. So did you have to pinch yourself and say, I'm getting up and I'm going to work at the Pentagon? You know, it's funny. It's kind of like all my jobs that I had in the military. I just kind of focused on what I what I needed sure. to get done. And, at, and in working at that level, it's a lot of... Um, relationship building mm-hmm. to get policies and programs through the Pentagon, which is a huge bureaucracy, mm-hmm. and then also to work with Congress to get programs funded or to get additional funding for programs. So I was just so focused on what I was doing, sure. I rarely ever thought about it. It could be a very, I think, overwhelming place if you let yourself sure. think about that sure. instead of just focusing on what you're there for. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of that. So, you know, when I think about the military, I always think about folks who've gone overseas or people who serve in the reserves. I don't think about the the behind the scenes administrative part of it. So you talked about like moving things through Congress or making sure that there's budget um, for for um, for the military operations. So I forget about the full scope of what happens behind the scenes. So so give me an idea of what a typical day might have been like for you in the Pentagon in terms of maybe meetings you had to have or agendas you had to move ahead. Um, give, give me a, give me an idea of what the day at the day in the life of a general might look like. Wow. So, um, as a deputy chief for the army reserve, um, I was, I kind of had oversight for a lot of different areas. Um, a lot of it was like, I'd say programs mm-hmm. and, uh, my boss was is a three star in the Army Reserve. We only go up to a three star level. All right. So there's only one three star, and that individual is responsible for the entire Army Reserve, wow. civilians and um, families and soldiers. So as a deputy, I kind of had to cover a lot of meetings that my mm-hmm. three star couldn't attend because he was traveling around sure, the globe sure. because we were a global organization. So he had a lot of things he had to do that took him mm. out of the building, as we call the Pentagon, the building for sure. Sure, sure. So I would go to a lot of three star meetings that, that dealt with um, training plans, um, you know, as I said, funding, um, different programs. Um, there were, they, I had a staff of 
two people who man- tried to manage me <laughs> because I had a lot of meetings. I mean, some days I would just walk in and be meeting after meeting after meeting. Sure. Um, and I got, you know, slides and things before the meetings happened. You'd get the first set of slides and you get the final set of slides. Mm-hmm. And I had to review all those things in between my meetings. I was sure. reviewing things for other meetings. Then, of course, there was the, the strategy that, you know, he and I and the senior staff there would talk about. We had a lot of senior civilians. Realists, really, for most people, they don't realize that the, mil- the military overwhelmingly relies on civ- a full-time civilian staff for continuity. Because mm-hmm. most of us do our assignments for two, three, maybe tops four years. Mm-hmm. And so the, the continuity, the institutional knowledge is with the civilians, who are there on a permanent basis. And many of them have basically the the equivalent rank that I would have. So we'd have, so I'd be in meetings with those people, um, talking about issues, going over challenges that we were having, coming up with strategic plans, uh, approving plans, because we had a lot of levels of of approval before it ever got to the four-star level Mm -hmm. or to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or or the uh, the chief of staff of the Army is what they would call him. And, um, And it's always been a him. So uh, okay. to this point. So in any event, those were some there were some pretty packed days. I mean, they'd start with 730 meetings. Sometimes I'd be there for seven o'clock to meet somebody for coffee. Mm-hmm. And I rarely ever left before six or seven. And then I'd get home and sure. do things at night. Sure. Wow. Well, I just want to say that I really appreciate that service. But that's that's amazing. And it's it, it's, it's hard for me to think that someone can basically tap you on your shoulder and say you need it. You're, you're, the country needs you. We're we, we're facing a crisis, so we need you just to pick up and move. But that's what that's what folks do who enlist as well. At every level, folks are doing that. But until you sit down and talk with someone, you don't realize what that really looks like. You, like you're a Madison resident, you're a Wisconsinite, but your office and your work is in is in Washington for an extended period of time. That's that's really amazing. And and what I'd like to share about that too is when you're in the reserve and the guard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we have full time jobs, and we all have made a commitment that if we get called for this other job, that we're going to show up, that we're going to go. It's just really not an option to say, no, I can't do that. Sure. And, um, you know, to, that can, though, be a hardship on our families. Because most of us live in the middle of America. Mm-hmm. We don't live near Fort Benning, Georgia, right, right. or an Air Force base or a Naval base. Mm-hmm. So we leave our families. And then what happens is our families are kind of here with the rest of the families, but we don't have the same kind of support systems for those families that you will find on a full-time installation. Mm. So I just want people to remember that in your community, your next door neighbor, when you you hear that their family member has deployed, I would ask you to go over and check on them. That's a great reminder. You know, that that spouse is there maybe managing with a couple of kids. Sure. Things around the house need to get done. They may need somebody to give them a little respite so they can get a break from the kids. I just encourage your listeners to think about those guard and reserve families in their community. And it's more than just thank you for your service. Sure. Lend them a helping hand. Definitely. Definitely. Because when they're deployed, there's not necessarily a lot of notice. Well, there's this, there's plenty of notice, mm-hmm. but it's just that whole but year gone, when someone's year. gone, all those duties and responsibilities fall on one person who's been left right. behind. That's a great reminder of some things that we can do to be helpful. As, as you look back in, um, in the earlier days, do, well, first of all, how did you get involved in the military? Now, someone said that you, you just, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, don't ask that question. Don't ask that. How did you get involved? I won't, I won't necessarily bring up what I found in some of my research, but... Um, that you're trying to just... It was an accident. It was an accident. I I was in college. I'm an accidental member of the the military. I was in college and, um, you know, at those time, at that time, and probably like now, you have certain required courses you have to get done. And at Creighton required everybody to have some kind of a science credit. (laughs) And, um, you know, I was working my way through school. I had a couple part-time jobs and the only science that I wanted to take was astronomy To meet this requirement, but of course I had a night job, so I couldn't take astronomy class, and I didn't want to take anything that required messing with chemicals or cutting anything up. Biology wasn't my thing. So I've been standing in the old days. You stood in line to sign up for your classes in big old hot gyms. Remember that before computers, young people, and um, (laughs) I'm looking around and okay, what can I sign up for? I got to get this credit out of the way. And there was, this, there was this one table with nobody standing in line. <laughs> and the sign said, Military Science Department. And I was like, I don't even know what that is, right? So I walk over because there's this one person who looks lonely. So I go over and talk to him. And he explains that it, is, it, does, it does count as a science credit. 
And I said, when does it meet? It met at like 8 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I thought, well, I'm an early person. That works great. (laughs) And I saw posters of people jumping out of airplanes and walking through the woods. I thought it was hiking. It wasn't hiking. (laughs) And um, I said, and they were repelling. I said, well, this looks like physical education class. And he says, yeah, it's kind of like that. (laughs) And so I'm Miss Gullible. And so what's the deal here? Well, you just sign up. And oh, and by the way, there's this thing called a stipend. Well, I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois. I, that word was not in my vocabulary. Right. What is this? Use it in a sentence, please. Use it in a sentence, please. And uh, he said, well, it's $100 a month. Now, remember, this is 1978. Sure, I got you. That was 77. That's a, that's that was a lot money. of money. That yes, was a lot is. of money. $100 yes. a month. I said, and he said, and it was tax-free. Really? Just to go to class? Oh, sign me up. <laughs> ROTC, whatever. Yeah, I'll do it. I signed up. That's how I got into ROTC. Oh, my goodness. Yes. But it was good. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. Well, yes, I, yes, there was some physical, more physical activity, but I liked running. I didn't mind doing push-ups. I, I was learning how to do other things. You got to hike. I got to hike, yeah, <laughs> right, with a, with a compass and get completely lost. Um, but uh, it, it, there was a lot of leadership, a lot of history, which I loved. Sure. And I'd never really looked at military history and how it kind of was interwoven with who we are mm-hmm. as a country. Sure. And it was fascinating. So I enjoyed it. Hi, this is Jeremy Holiday, and I'm one of the editors of the Black Like Me show. And I just want to take a minute now to talk to you a little bit about Patreon. And the show that we put together here is the culmination of an effort of a lot of people. And in order to do it, we need your support. We've been working for a while to come up with a Patreon that works well for people. And the levels that existed before, we recently added the $2 level, which is there for you if you like the show and you just want to give a little bit of support. It's cheaper than a cup of coffee. I mean, I don't think you can find a cup of coffee anywhere or a half a cup of coffee for $2. And we have a $6 level where you'll get a shout out on the show, a $10 level where you could submit questions to Dr. G and he'll respond to them. And then the $25 level, which is whenever we have a live event, you get a VIP invite. And whenever we start producing merch, you get that merch as well. So if you like what you hear on the show and you want to support it, go to patreon.com slash black like me and check out the levels to see if one fits for you. Now back to Dr. G. Now, you know, in, in our community, there's there's some fear about military because either because we had uncles or grandfathers who were in certain wars or came back, you know, just stressed. And so I don't know that we really talk about it a lot in, in at least in African-American community. Do you would you encourage parents to encourage their children? Would you encourage young adults today, African-American adults to consider careers in, in the military? I would definitely you say would. that. And I'm going to I'll I'll say what I've said to other people Please. is that if we are not at the table, then we are on the menu. Mm. Now, why do I say that? Why do you say that? Not that I say we need to not everybody can be Colin Powell, of course, and run the military. But a lot of people who serve in the military end up serving in other roles in our government. Mm-hmm. And they are current secretary of state as a West Point graduate. Mm. There are other people in our government right now who are making life-changing decisions for all of us, and they started out in the military. It's a large network of people. It's a credential that gets people into a lot of places. It definitely does. And going to the service academies, again, it gives young people an entree into a very... One, a very powerful alumni association, I'll simply say. That's a great way of looking at it. All for a five-year commitment and a free education. And a free education. Yes. And I just want to tell some of the listeners who don't realize, 95% of the jobs in the military do not put you in harm's way. You are not going to be shot at. Because 95%? Le- 95%. You look at the things that we do in the Army, for example. The majority of our people are not infantry. Sure, infantry. Sure. They are logistics. They work in cybersecurity. Um, they are medical. They are engineers. Legal. They are transportation, legal. So if you think about what, the, what, what is in the city of Madison right now, most of the occupations that are in the city of Madison right now, you will find in the military. We could mm-hmm. run a city. We have engineers who can run uh, water treatment plants and sure, sewage facilities sure. and, and repair the roads, plan the, the road systems, basically urban planning in a sense. People who can run mm-hmm. the hospital systems all the way from the administrators up to the surgeons. They're in the military. So 
people that look at it and think one way, I sure. think need to look at it another way. And as I said before, I, lo- I like that. Yeah. And as I said before, people leave, do their five years of, as an officer and then go on other things in their lives. Um, and they are now part of a huge network. Wow. You know, I, I won't. I, I, I love that you're a consummate leader and you don't focus on all of the of the negative things that may happen when people were not ne- necessarily accustomed to working closely with females or African-American females. But what kept you what kept you focused and just continuing your work when you because as people of color and those of us who are trailblazers, we feel some of the oddness when we when we walk into space, but uh, in spaces. But you didn't allow that to stop you. Was it the teaching of your mom? Was it? You know, things that your dad instilled in you or your grandma. What just helped you to keep pushing? Because when I think of military, I think of very white male dominated space. And so what what motivated you to keep to keep pushing and to not take no for an answer and to not let people get in your head? You know, you're absolutely right. I was a very when I came in 19 when I was commissioned in 1979 as a second lieutenant. Yeah, I was pretty well overwhelmingly white and male. Mm-hmm. And there were some people who were openly skeptical and some who were even a little bit hostile sure but i had very strong african-american women in my family Mm -hmm. and i was raised to believe that i had every right to be in that space and that i was smart and that i was talented and that the organization would benefit from having me i love that and so they'd be lucky to get you they'd be lucky to get me in other words and so and i also realized after a while I could run circles around some of these people when sure. I was on half speed. And so I just went, wait a minute, because there's a sense of a lot of for them. It was a lot of, I think, a sense of entitlement mm-hmm. um, that they just were, you know, they had every right to be there. I was the one who was. And I was like, no, I've done my homework. I've worked harder. I've researched this. I've thought about it a little bit more deeply than you have. And here's what I want to do. I also, I think, connected with other people better. Mm hmm. And I made them know that I appreciated what they brought to the table. So just because you were a sergeant or a private in my book and you didn't have a master's degree or my or my college degree didn't mean you were not smart and you right. didn't know your job. And in fact, as an officer in the military, if you made a huge mistake, if you went in and thought you were smarter than the average bear, <laughs> because you were not the subject matter expert, your right. ENS, your non-commissioned officers and your privates were. And if you. And your warrant officers. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't respect their intelligence and their expertise, they were going to let you fail. Mm. They said, oh, sure, Lieutenant, you think you can you can do all this by yourself? You go right ahead. Have ma'am. at it. Have at it. And so I just kind of used that, those those strong women in my background, my appreciation for the people that worked for me throughout my career. And I leaned on them sometimes. Sure. Because there were times when my officer colleagues would not tell me when a meeting was happening. They wouldn't they would leave out important information. I won't even look shocked. Yeah. So it doesn't that's not just in my world, nonprofit world, university world that happens in the military and yep. business as well in business as well. And so, again, it's that's why it's even more important to have a connection with the people who work for you. Let them know you've got their back. You'll take care of them. You provide mm-hmm. them with the resources they need. You'll treat them fairly. They will walk over a crush glass for you if they feel that yes, they can trust yes. you as a leader. Um, and so I, I leveraged those, those, all of those things throughout my That's career. That's good leadership. Wow. So tell me how you changed the military. Cause you, cause you're, I mean, you're talking about these opportunities where it's given you a chance to grow. Um, but where are places, what are some of the places where you think you had an impact? Of course, people watching the trajectory of your, of your career growth, um, certainly did that. But, um, you know, is there legislation that you helped to, to craft or, um, rules that you worked on. Um, I know one time in a leadership um, venue, you talked to some of the participants in my program about something you did around African American, um, a- African American hair and with women. And that might not be the thing that you think about, but I'm just curious about as you look back, what impact do you think you had on they, military? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think certainly being in the room in many meetings and just having a different perspective. Okay. And that's true in business as well. Exactly. I just see things differently and I I saw how to train people differently. I did different things when I was training um, my drill sergeants when I had a unit of drill sergeants that other people had not tried. But I I like the, that. The thing that I am most proud of um, was the role I think I I contributed to mm-hmm. the the at least certainly the army's. Um, understanding and policies regarding African-American hairstyles for Mm -hmm. women. Um, Their 
was a policy that I got wind of that was going to be a major um change to the policy, which I knew was going to impact black women disproportionately. Sure. And fortunately, someone got me, as we, we call it in the building, a bootleg copy of the slides that were going to be <laughs> sent around and some of the stuff. And so I looked at it and, and some of the young black female officers knew and they brought it to me and they said, ma'am, you need to see this. And I hadn't been paying attention to it because it wasn't in my area exactly. at that time. And I was really disappointed and disturbed by some of the way the regulations sure. were going to change because they were going to cause stress on African-American hair scal- your scalps because mm-hmm. you can't have hair braided too tightly. Some of the language in there suggested that our hairstyles were not professional. Oh. Which is code for other things, as of we course, know. Of course. And I said, so no, So that's no. been going on for a while now. Yes. Okay. So I said, no, I'm, I'm going to have to figure this out. And um, I was, again, approached by some other black female officers who mm-hmm. were very upset about all this. And so I came up with a strategy in my own head. I talked to some of the other African-American generals who were mm-hmm. around at the time, just let them know what I was thinking. And then I approached what we would call in the army that was the chief personnel officer for the army of three star mm-hmm. who had, had been in my performance rating chain sure. earlier when I was at Fort Knox and I asked to see him and I, as really? I tell people now, I said, I went in and I said, I said, sir, I have to explain something to you. And I basically <laughs> said it like that. I said, I'm gonna explain black hair to you. And he looked at me and I, cause I, at that time my hair was still straightened. Sure. And I said, this hairstyle I have can be very, it's very it could be very unhealthy for me. I explained that you know the impact of chemicals, exactly. The some research that suggested that Black women have fibroids because we've put mm-hmm. so many chemicals on mm-hmm. our scalp. Nobody's done a study, but it suggests that um, this the way that this regulation was suggesting we braid our hair was too tight. It was going to cause stress on the scalp. Right. Could cause hair loss. And and also said I objected to the characterization of these hairstyles as unprofessional. Wow. What and. I just laid it out to him. And this was a three star. It was a three star. And I said, here's, and I had already talked to some of the young females. I said, you guys need to do a white paper. I'm going to review it before you send it to him. Mm-hmm. So it's not emotional. I sure. said, it's got to be factual. And the suggestion in it was to have a, a, um, a, a working group formed that was comprised of hair and scalp specialists, members of the military from various backgrounds to talk about this issue and come up with a different policy that would still meet the requirements for wearing your headgear, Wearing mm-hmm. protective masks. Sure. We don't call them gas masks. Sure. They're called protective masks. Protective. Because you have to be able to have a good seal. Otherwise, there's no point in putting it on. Right. And during a chemical attack. Right. So we wanted to make sure we, we accommodated all those things, but also accommodated, you know, our culture and our heritage. Sure. And so at the end of the day, they came out with a different policy that wow. allows twists and locks and braids. And um, you are a part of that. I was I was a small part of that. I was simply, I think, the catalyst sure. for letting the leadership know this was a bad approach. And coincidentally, um, some women from the Congressional Black Caucus had gotten wind of it. And they had sent a letter to the Secretary of the Army saying, what is this? Are you suggesting that our hairstyles are unprofessional? Oh, really? So there was some there was a I think a perfect storm of sure, things that happened. Sure. And I happened to be there and I happened to be in the right place. I remember once when you were telling this story to to our leadership program, there was a woman who had been in the military during that period of time. And she raised her hand and said, that was you that helped to facilitate that. Thank you, because I was at risk of being told how to wear my hair, that you had to do it a particular way. Well, they were discharging. They were, pro- they they were, were, discharging? They were discharging women before, yes. Who because were, they didn't want to straighten their hair. They were already, well, or because well, they wore braiding and are wearing in styles that, or had Afro puffs, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there were, there were some women who were being wow. disciplined for that. And so that stopped. No, that's and I love the way you encouraged um, other colleagues to write a white paper that was very factual. You went into the three star, but then all of a sudden, also things were were um, a wind of this was caught by uh, members of Congress. And so just being in the midst of that and 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 um, helping to facilitate the process or contribute in, in in a way is a great glimpse into leadership because. We sometimes think that leadership has to head everything and run with every ball. But sometimes it's being in the room, is knowing how to be strategic, not being at the table so that I like that so that you're not on the menu. Um, but but the the levels and the quality of leadership that you exuded by how you listened, how you empowered, how you approached, how you stood back when you needed to. It's just a great sign of how we move things ahead. If we don't have to get credit for doing something, 
a lot more can can be accomplished. Ex- exactly. And, and and that's why I say we have to have more people of color in the military. Definitely. If we say, oh, I'm not going to do that because people keep saying because Vietnam. I said, I'm sorry. None of you who are saying this were even born when Vietnam happened. <laughs> so to say, yes, people went were sent were, were, were drafted and went and sent disproportionately to the front lines. That may have happened, but that's not my reality today. And and so I really encourage more people of color to think about serving. I'd like the way you put that. Um, Do you think that people in in general are more or less patriotic than they were when you started your military career? I think people are just as patriotic. They may, I think they may express it differently. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, as, as someone told me along in my military career, she said, it's not wrong. It's just different. Mm. And so I think we have to be able to appreciate how each other express ourselves. Sure. Um, you know, I and I and I think we also have to re, really be more um, accepting of each other's opinions. Sure. About sure. things that, that we certainly have lost that. We don't know how to be tolerant and we don't know how to have um, disagreement. Right. Without trying to destroy each other. So I want to make sure I'm understanding you so that even if there's something that I'm I'm discontented with and I've and I voice that, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm that I lack patriotism. I mean, there are certain things I challenge because I want my university, my city, my nation to be better. I do it out of a sense of patriotism because I know who we can be and what we what we want to be. Is that what you mean when you say that they're different, that that the the passion towards patri- patriotism um, it's pretty much the same, but that it might be expressed differently. Absolutely. I think that that passion may manifest itself in different ways. Sure. But we all That's have helpful. we all want the organization to be better. Yes. And yes. organizations in order to be better have to evolve. And they have to listen. And they have to listen. So if you say, well, we have to do it the same way we did in the 1950s. It's 2019, folks. So my idea about how what that looks like may be different mm-hmm. than what you saw in the 1950s. Because right. you have to evolve. You have to change. Sure. And so patriotism is going to manifest itself in different ways. Definitely. Now, as a, as a military leader, um, you, you, you have to be able to manage your emotions, I'm sure, and, and, and come across as professional. But have you ever been in settings because of your role and inside yourself? You said, oh, like, how many presidents have you had a chance to meet? Oh, None. None. OK. All right. <laughs> I mean, I've been to the White House, but that isn't just because you've been to the White House doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you that you, to, you got to meet the but you, Obamas. But, but I was but in the same room. You're but, in the same you're in the same room. Right, you certainly right. got a commendation from him at, 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 at your at your retirement. OK. But but how about military folks? Have you been in a room and maybe the Joint Chief of Staff? So am I saying that name right? Or military chiefs? You walk in a room and think this is this is the secretary of the military. This is. Yeah, I've been in the room with I've been in the room with uh, the secretary of defense. Mm. Um at the time it was Secretary Gates. Um, we had a conversation and discussion with him. I really liked him a lot. I was part of. Really? And we had a, we had a conversation and discussion with him. I really liked him a lot. Um, and, um, you know, Panetta, et cetera. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. It, it, what I found was when they reached that level, or at least those individuals, they were very down to earth. Um, you know, they didn't, you could tell that they really didn't like all the trappings that came with their job, <laughs> sure. but they, 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 they went along with it. Sure. And they really did want to hear your honest opinion, so long as you were respectful. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I could have been really intimidated, but they didn't create an intimidating environment. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you're a member of the team. Mm-hmm. Is there a television show or has there been a movie that you've watched about, about, um, the military or, or that you look at and you say, you know, that's, 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 it's like that. Sometimes I ask my friends who are doctors, the same question about ER or some of those other things. So have you watched, you know, Saving Private Ryan or MASH or anything that you just, well, I know, I know the military is not like MASH, but have you, have you looked at anything and just said, you know, it's, it's kind of like that on days or, or that's not too far off. I know it's still been, you know, had, it's had its Hollywood flavoring, but you know, there are days it's kind of like that. Oh, that conversation kind of went that way. Can you think of anything you've seen that's that's depicted? Wow. You know, most of the time, Amos, my husband, will tell you that I watch these TV shows and movies and I'm screaming at the television. <laughs> that's the wrong way to wear the uniform. No, you look like a dirtbag. No, oh. you would never say that to a general. Or no, you'd never say that to a sergeant. Or no, you would never do that. Um, I will <laughs> say that I, and for the 
your older listeners maybe, um, the opening scene and some of the scenes in Saving Private Ryan that you just mm-hmm. mentioned were actually, I think, no, I've never been in combat, but they are pretty accurate. You know, that scared the crap out of me. It And I went to see that. When at, I saw that. Right. I went to see that at the movie, and there were some older gentlemen sitting behind me. And at one point, I, I heard a noise, and I turned around, and they were all sitting there crying very quietly. Did you see that here in Madison? Yeah, I saw it here in Madison. Because I went to I went to see a, um, a matinee preview of mm-hmm. it, and there were older vets who cried. It made me cry. I sat in my car and cried, because I'd yeah. never been in a room where, you know, outside of a funeral, mm-hmm. where older, and these were stoic-looking older mm-hmm. men who, um, um, particularly after that one, after that one question, when uh, the Tom Hanks character, someone said, "You know, am I a good man mm-hmm. or something?" And then these guys just lost it. They lost it. And so yeah. I, and so at that point, I wondered, is this really what it's like? You know, um, or, or parts of this, what it was really like? And um, I, I so think it's the, interesting. You'd mentioned the same movie, movie that right. I saw. And I think the movie Red Tails, African Americans had to deal with during sure. during World War Two, and even sometimes, as I said, I ran into people who right. were not real thrilled that I was there and, and kind of questioned whether I was some kind of an affirmative action, sure, you know, sure, hire. Sure. They're like, no, guys, I worked my way up just, just in like Maxi you did. and harder than you did. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, those, and, but a lot of the television shows, you know, they've, they got to pack a lot into a half an hour and an hour and they, they take liberties. They, <laughs> they take, a lot, they take liberties a lot of liberties with, with the way, you know, way things are done and the way sure. the conversations that might happen behind closed doors between subordinates and, and, sure, and, um, sure. and seniors, senior leaders. So, most television shows I don't okay. really like very much. No, I got you. Now, listen, this is just this is just shifting gears just a little bit because, of course, the fact that you're a general is is very impressive. But you're on the board of directors of the Greenway of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Do you get? <laughs> no, I mean, when people hear that, because you know we love our Packers mm-hmm. in you know in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you do because you're you're on the board. Um, are, are board meetings monthly, quarterly? Board meetings are more more quarterly. They're more quarterly. Um, and the the board, while we have an executive committee mm-hmm. um, that works closely with the president, Mark Murphy, mm-hmm. and we also have a you know an investment kind of a finance committee. Sure. Um, you know, it's a it's a community team. The team yes. is owned by the the, the fans. That's right. Um, is it not still the majority? Is it still the only NFL team that's owned by fans? It is the only. Sure. Absolutely. It is a different model, but so the so the 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 community and the and the organization are very closely linked, mm-hmm. and not just the Green Bay community, the entire state. I'm a trustee on the foundation. All right. They have a rather large foundation mm-hmm. and they make an effort. We, do, we the trustees make an effort to provide uh, the support to community-based organizations around our state. And um, so there's a lot of community outreach. The players sure. do a lot. The players, I think, give a lot of their time. Uh, it's just a wonderful organization, and um, so no, I'm not in. I'm not involved in player operations. That is not the role of the <laughs> so, board. So I can't even go into that question. <laughs> we don't. We don't get any of that information. I will. I will tell people honestly. No, I don't know which trades are coming, okay. and it's a good uh, thing. I don't want to know. Right. Right. It's not my job. It's not my role. It's my role is is as part of the community to link the the organization to the fans and to the greater Wisconsin um, a community sure. in, in terms of who the team is and what they do. It's sure. not just a football team. Sure. Now, and because of your, your role on the board and, ha- you know, and, and having served in the military, I won't ask you any thoughts about Kaeper- Kaepernick or anything like that, but off the, off the air, I, I thought off the air, I might <laughs> just ask you just, just a couple of questions um, uh, about that. Listen, you all, I've been having this incredible discussion um, with a friend, with a role model, with the leader, a tried leader, um, General Marsha Anderson. She has served um, our nation um, so aptly and so professionally and so diligently. And we appreciate you and others, not just for trailblazing, but for um, getting up each day, thinking about the safety and the good of our country and its people. That's that's so, so important. But I also think that it's great that you're still in our community. Um, you know, you retired from, from one career and then you'll be celebrating, you know, another retirement coming up soon. But there's still so much good that you do in the community. You know, I'll, I'll look in some paper online and you're speaking to a group or you're encouraging people. And so I appreciate the fact that you've not burned yourself out to the point of you have nothing of having nothing else to give. And, and often unassuming, like people would not like you don't you don't wear all these, you know, army hats, buttons, badges that, that say, hey, 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 two star major general, two star general, two star general. But you, and you'd be justified in doing it if you did. But just the fact that you're in our community and you keep that wealth of knowledge here and the fact that you offer yourself just so unselfishly. 
to this community is just really, really important. So thank you for stopping by here. Thank you for taking time to talk with us and for just encouraging our leaders to think about what it takes and costs to be a trailblazer, how you positioned yourself each day in your careers to be a trailblazer as a, as a female leader who happens to be African-American and for doing it with such grace and style and, um, and perseverance. It really is an honor to have you here. So thank you for spending time with us in the Black Like Me studios today. It has been my absolute pleasure and joy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you. sure. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holiday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Ooh,